grateful to uh, to be here. Uh, and, and last August, when uh, when it was uh, the invitation was extended to me, I checked up on this group Cedar. And uh, and like uh, Sachem Trombley had mentioned, and and uh, his uh, daughter Annika. Um, said yesterday, cedar is really important to us. It's a big medicine. And I associate that medicine with this project here and what, the, what this project seeks to do. I'm a Turtle Clan Nipmuc on my mother's side, and I'm Otter Clan Wampanoag Mashpee from my father's side. And I grew up in my father's community, so I think more like an otter. And if you know anything about otters, and Grandpa Utube might help you. Um, if otters have this curiosity impact, but they're also quite mischief. And I can't escape that. So I tend to be very mischief in, in how I live my life in the world, kind of thing. And so I'm going to introduce you to a little bit of otter mischief this morning. Uh, and it's my intention that you survive this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in thinking about energy transitions and decolonization, which is the specific what I want to talk about, um, I, I, I sort of talked about, put it in the context of Earth, human life ways, and the esoteric. And I'm very fond of the esoteric. Um, and it, it uh, conjures up a great deal of imagination for me. Uh, and um, Chief Agaji, Chief Trombley, Mega Mahan, and Janice Harvey are the reasons I'm here today. I have a deep respect and love for, every, for them and what they have brought to my life. So if you have to blame somebody for my appearance, <laughs> That was, that was the, but I'm taking full responsibility for what I'm saying, so. Um, and I'm looking at, I'm looking at this topic in a little bit different, and just to explain a little bit, those, those images there, you, you see Chief um, Arlo Looking Horse, was a Lakota chief, and he carries a very special gift. He carries the original pipe that was gifted by the Buffalo Nation to the Lakota people. We don't know how long of that, but he's the 19th generation who holds that pipe. And um, that very special place, uh, which the world knows is the devil tower, Devil's Tower, but it's a sacred tapi unkashna of the people. And we made a special journey there because of a movie called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. This is a very holy place to the Lakota people. And we went there with the intention of apologizing, bringing our medicines there. And we were told on our way over uh, by some Lakota elders about the meaning of Madio Adibi, um, and that the people used to go there and still go there for ceremonies. And uh, while we were there, and we did what we set out to do, and a m miraculous thing happened as we did that. Our daughter, who is now close to 40, was a baby. She was three months old, I think. And uh, after we were finished the ceremony, the mountain talked to us. And it talked to us in a voice that we thought part of the mountain must have collapsed. But there was no evidence of that. It spoke to us. It addressed us. And to this day, I'm so moved by our relationship to the sacred. And it's important to invite our nations of the sacred who live before us and who are going to follow us. And that's the, that's the message I want to bring about the nature of the esoteric. It's what we don't see that manifests what we do see. And that is the relationship kind of thing. And then there's the wampum belt right in the center for my nation. 
the original wampum belt, this is brand new, the original wampum belt uh, was said to be um, three feet wide and 12 feet long. And it recorded everything about us and our relationship. You know, as has been said, the original treaties. We have the, uh, the um, uh, image of, of four medicines that guide everything that we do in life. One of them is the tobacco, which is gifted to us at the time of our creation, the original treaty. And uh, the neat thing about it is no matter what industry has done to the tobacco, it still works. And so I caution you out there in the audience who use tobacco, if you have to smoke, always think good thoughts because that message is being shared to creation. And it's probably one of the reasons the world is in the shape that it is because there are a lot of people out there smoking. And they smoke when they're really uptight kind of thing. And I can just imagine the maker of all life saying, what? <laughs> you want what? <laughs> kind of, you know, it's, it's a little bit of an inside joke, but there's something about that, <laughs> about the nature of this. Um, so I love the saying when I first seen it. Um, it makes a lot of sense. I think our job today and maybe in, in the near future is to determine what direction are we are, where are we, you know, and, and to really understand. But it's also a gentle warning. You know, we need to be mindful about what lies before us and what we control. So my take on energy transitions is something that we seldom think about because we're, we're kind of focused about energy use and, and what's available. I want to focus on the energy that we seldom think about and that's in here, the energies that we carry. Because like the esoteric nature, the energies that we carry and that provide us with thought consciousness, provide us with existence, determines what we use out in the world and how we use it in the world. And that's a very big factor kind of thing. So I, I kind of came across this and I thought, well, it's pretty neat instead of trying to list it all myself. Uh, and of course, these values uh, are not all the values. Um, and as human beings, we tend to transcend both, both sides, you know, it's not just we're stuck in one, one aspect of it. So the question, the initial question I propose is where does society and, ec and economy spend most of our time, right? Because that's going to determine, well, it does determine where we're at. There's obvious difference between the images of the, of the um, pyramid and the, and the circle, and I want to get to that in a second. And for Indian country, this resonates to us. This simple message resonates with us. Um, but I want to also suggest it's about you too. What's ever happened or whatever brought you here to this side of the world? You know, in 1492, you know, something shifted for the world. Um, and while I'm thinking about this, we're not the savages the, 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 the uh, uncivilized, the unthinking, the primitive people that we were described as. We have a really deep culture with really unimaginable ideas, worldviews, kind of thing. But it not, and, and what existed in this side of the world, in this whole hemisphere, there are only Indian people and we knew of each other. Life was really dynamic in those days. And then things started to shift for us, 500 years. But the interesting thing about that is that the shift has not been enough to dissuade us from our relationship to Earth and creation. It doesn't have that kind of power. It kind of reminds me of what society has done to women has not been enough to dissuade them from being women. 
And I think the real connective here is the day that women become women and think in women terms and be women of their own free life is when we have a future. As I'm going to share in a, in a little while, we're living with a female planet in the, in the, in the lens of Indian country. And the feminine is the centrality of our whole existence. That's for Indian country, but I suspect uh, that's true for the rest of the world. Um, so, the pyramid. And the, and the, the question for us, <coughs> essentially, is do we live within the life cycles of creation or do we live outside of it? And the pyramid model seems to suggest that our main focus is living outside of Earth, outside of creation. Whereas for indigenous peoples, it's inseparable from us. We as human beings are part of creation. Um, and then as you kind of can see, there's, there's certain aspects that I can sort of zoom in on. And you can read, by the way, um, my nature is if I'm making presentations, I also want to put it in writing. So there's a, a written narrative with most of these images. And, and they're to your uh, avail. I sent a copy to Susan, and you can contact me directly, and I'll be glad to share this with you, kind of thing. So you don't really have to focus on a whole lot if you want to see this before. But I, I took um, a line out of Star Trek. Star Trek is one of my favorite movies, as is Star Wars. And one of my favorite teachers is Master Yoda. I pay a lot of attention to what he says. Because uh, he makes sense. You know, talks from the heart kind of thing. So um, this, this line in, in Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan, the second movie, talks about the needs of the few or the one sometimes outweigh the needs of the many, which seems to suggest, the pyramid seems to suggest that. You know, and, and part of our problem is that we've been so estranged from creation, we don't even know that creation is always trying to grab our attention in many, many fundamental ways. You know. And the whole resolve to all of this melodramas that we, we put ourselves through is the, sh the shift in our attitude. I use the term original teachings because in our communities there's a great deal of strife. There's a great struggle of maintaining our connection to creation by way of our traditional original teachings and the imposition that was put in and, and it's steadily fueled and funded and in violent ways maintained. It's a tremendous struggle in our communities. We're growing up outside of ourselves, not with ourselves. So part of our solution is to heal that. And not to forget that the tribal councils and the band councils and the band chiefs and the tribal chiefs are our cousins and their families. But they're so disconnected from what I'm talking to you about, the original teachers, the original teachings, and the responsibilities that continue for us. I think so. Uh, I found this pretty useful. Um, I recall a time uh, we're, we're encouraged because of the identity that we carry, Wampanoag, Wabanaki, you know, Wampum. Um, these are all connectors, markers of our relationship to that light in the sky. We know as Wampanoag, one of the great mothers of creation, and there are many of them. Um, and I recall, you know, we're supposed to have, you have early in the morning sacrifice, make our prayers, you know, before the sun rises. Because then the sun is going to take that energy and, and move it across the world. So we try to be really conscious of that. But this one morning, I was, uh, I got up late and the sun was just about to 
to burst through the horizon, another birth. And you see two robins behind me. And they're chit-chatting. I'm trying to get my attention. And, uh, and I turned around and I said in my language, take this message for me. And the moment I said that, they took off. And then the sun came up. I have such deep conversations with Megha Mahan. And, and, that, and particularly when we spend that, that first, uh, after we get up, we have our coffee and we're sitting around the table and these really deep conversations come up. It's what we carry, our experience, you know? Really profound kind of thing. And a lot of it is about the language and how the language connects us to the esoteric. The esoteric is all around us, always feeding us, always helping us through the day. You know, I'm so eternally grateful for that kind of a relationship. And it's Megha Mahan and Rani and so many others who, who speak the language that our language comes directly from our relationship to creation, from the earth. You know, and so when I spoke to those robins, it appeared that they understood what my dilemma was, because they took right off with what I was hope was my message. <laughs> Maybe they were talking about me. Who knows? You know, Maybe I owed somebody some money. You know, you never can tell about these things. You know, why we do the things we do, kind of things. Um, but what I noticed is is that. And it's true, it's not about English, it's not even about speaking our language. What's, what's happening here is the feelings, the emotion behind those sounds that we're making, that creation speaks, that understands. It's the feelings, it's the emotional values that we carry. Which also made me think about uh, Professor Einstein's theory of relativity, relationships kind of thing, and talking about energy. You know, you need to revisit that kind of thing. And, and to emphasize my culture, as, as most of indigenous cultures, not only throughout this hemisphere, but indeed throughout the world, have the feminine base of our existence. But done to it is a term that my culture understands as the sacred house, the house of the creator. And, and so when Ronnie is talking about the difference between homeland and territory, you know, homeland, we're always in our home. That's what Katantuit does for us. The sky is our ceiling, right? And the earth supports us, is the flooring. And we're, in the, and we're in the Creator's house at all times. We have a term called Nyantaquat, and you don't have to worry about remembering that, but Nyantaquat talks exactly about that. The life above our heads, as Ronnie was saying, is the life below our feet. And everything between those realms are connected. It's inescapable. We're all relatives. And my ancient grandmas and grandpas knew that. We didn't have to be informed by some other civilization that at the time we understood was lacking. And now over 500 years, now we can define it as lacking. But lacking in a way that, that there is this immense opportunity to get reconnected. You know, it's profound. Kiatan, you ask anybody in my community, Kiatan, explain Kiatan, they would say, the creator, Manitou, the creator. But it's interesting to use, our language does not describe form, it describes action and activity. And so the, the heart of Manitou is talking about um, a very living consciousness and life. The source of life for our, for our bodies is the heart way, and we spend a lot of time thinking about the heart, living in and out of the heart, you know. Essential energy. 
Most of us are, are, have been persuaded by false narratives that we grow up with that this is, this is the truth. And the reality is you, if you don't feel it, and if you're not motivated by probably one of the greatest powers in the universe is love. You know, and if you're not motivated by that, you're lost. You know, we need to transit and use the energies that we have because they determine what kind of life we're going to have and what we do with our time. Eshkwaganit, of uh, an understanding about the form that existence takes. And, and, and women have this incredible amount of energy because of the nature that they carry. And you know that, particularly the mothers in this community. What it, what it requires to be a mother and to be a grandmother and to be a matriarch. You know, and, and to guide the people. We have a term in my community, Kichokwas. Kichokwas is a derivative from Kichokwant. Kichokwant is how we describe what the earth does. Kichokwas is describing the daughters of the earth. There's a place for, for men, <laughs> uh, but it's not essential. It's a, it's a helping force. It's there to help the women to do what they have to do so life can continue. Kind of thing. But you know, society hasn't been too friendly to women. I have two daughters. Well, Mika Mahan and I have two daughters. And we have four granddaughters out of five grandchildren. And I'm always concerned about their well being living in a space that's not friendly to women. And as men, we have a, an added responsibility because the threats to women are coming mostly from men. So we have an added responsibility to be mindful. I think right now that the, the count of murdered and missing indigenous women in Canada is well past 5,000. And there's no indication that it's stopping. And if it's that true in Canada, it's also true in the United States. Except the US doesn't talk about that. Um, our job, well, and this is kind of a determinant why there is such conflicts between the government and the government forces of Canada and in and, uh, and Indian country, is that we're moving out of this dynamic of threat to women because they hold the seat of our, of the necessity of continuing our life, another energy transit. You know, and I, I've had the wonderful opportunity to teach at the University of Maine, and I taught there for 10 years. And one of the interesting things about sharing this kind of diabolical knowledge to the classroom is I had a captive audience for a semester and what I'm sharing with you is, is I'm only touching the tip of the iceberg. Every one of these subjects that I'm sharing with you is at least a semester of investigation and sharing, you know. And this is one of them, consciousness. One of the primary focuses in the last 10, 15 years for me, my personal study, is what is consciousness kind of thing. The womb of existence that we just shared, shared a little while ago didn't come from me. It came from a conversation that I had with Coral, who's one of our grand, grandbabies, when she was eight months in utero. And I'm having this conversation with her. And I stepped out of the house one early um, April evening admiring the stars and the cold and the snow and all the different life forms around me. And I was thinking about coral, you know, and I, I was thinking, well, where coral is in her mother's womb, eight months in utero, this is her whole universe. This is everything that she knows. 
in all the sentient beings that we've referred to as cells or forming her body in, her, in the atmosphere and in, in, in hearing her mom and having a conversation with her mom in utero. And I get this message after I was thinking about this. And she's telling me, I'm in the womb too. Everything that I see here, you know, everything is interconnected to me. The womb of, the, of existence. And I couldn't wait to rush back to consult with Grandma Google. You know, Grandma, tell me about this womb of existence. It didn't exist <laughs> anywhere in, in the information channels. There was other wombs, but not the womb of existence. That comes from coral, a reminder. So, so what I'm suggesting is that the idea about consciousness is not just a subject matter of the brain, it's activity and what that activity does. I came across um, the, the workings of David Hawkins, who was a, a medical doctor and a psychologist. And in the near 30 years of, of his work with his clients, he developed this map. And if you see that the, the point is not to do away with what we refer to as our negative emotions. They're there for a reason, to help us, to help guide us. And if we sit with it, anger, frustration, fear, if we sit with it long enough, it starts to inform us what we need to know and what we should be doing. It's not the object of getting rid of, but we need to elevate uh, by choice and by will to live in a more um, profoundly enriched energetic transitions of our emotions to dwell there most of the time. If not, we need to yearn for that. We need to move into that. What would this world look like if it was guided by love? Because we were there one time. And then, then we got persuaded to do something different. And we all know, we can all testify in this room that what brings us to this question is, is the melodramas and the harm that's been happening out there in the world for so long. That needs to end. And it is ending. I thought about this one Christmas. December 24th, the evening of December 24th, is kind of a magical time. You know, because without any prompting, people open themselves up to each other. And they're friendly, and they talk about, they talk in a voice of kindness, you know, generosity. And strangely, we don't see that in the rest of the cycles, but December 24th, you know, it amazes me to no end. So I, I thought about the fact that it's not possible for any life form not to love, you know. And maybe it's kind of arrogant on the part of myself to think that other life forms uh, have a lesser degree of love. But this is what I notice, right? This is what I see. Um, doesn't have to be factual. Yeah. But this is what I see. Um, and the preponderance of our time seems to be that we live in fear-based realities. And it kind of guides what we do and what we don't do. Another need for energy transitions. Because we all have that capacity. And we've all lived in that capacity from time to time. But we also have the capacity of understanding the power of and profundity of love. And we see it all the time. And we're part of it all the time. So the esoteric, that's what's behind all this. But there's a darker use of energy, and I want to kind of spend just a little time how we undo ourselves because of the energies that we're using. 
fear-based realities. I love this, you know, Buckminster Fuller. It's sort of suggesting to us there's a way out of this. Like Gandhi had said in the movie, there's a way out of hell. You know? There's a way out of this too. Let's build something together. Because since the, the rise and the development of the United States and Canada, Indian country, we started off with these treaties. These treaties were about establishing a relationship and how we kind of can navigate this newness between us. You know, it's about peace, friendship, respect, kind of thing. We haven't had that relationship yet. And we've been left out of the development of Canada. Oh, well, they use some of our ideas, but we're not participants. We need to be participants in it because that's what the treaties demand of us, to be participants in how we grow this entity bef be between us, how we even name this society and where we're going together. One part Indian country, one part North America. Let's see what we can build together, kind of thing. And, and this is kind of just a restatement. There's a difference between living with the land and using the land. Remember those pyramids. You know, and so the challenge for us is how can we reimagine ourselves together? How do we rebuild, how do we build that togetherness? It's a challenge before us. And we have a lot of help. If the law means anything to anybody, you know, if the Constitution means anything, this, this is the primary directive of the constitutional mandates to respect and affirm indigenous treaties and indigenous rights. Section 25 is where we get, uh, coming out of the Royal Proclamation, where we get nation-to-nation -nation concepts and unceded territory concepts. And Section 25 embeds the Royal Proclamation but what most people don't know, it's not just the proclamation that was developed in October of um, 1763. The Crown called all the nations together in the summer of 1764 to talk about this proclamation and the meaning behind it. And the, and the nations, that it, there were nations in the East, and on the Great Lakes and on the plains that went to that council in Niagara. You know. And the nations brought with them the Turo Wampum Belt, which you see up here, just to remind the Crown about our relationships and our treaties. And the Crown had, had constructed, had ordered the wampum that you see there, the Niagara Wampum, 1764. And it restated our relationship as nation to nation. So kudos for Canada for including that in the Constitution as the leading law. This is our mandate to work together. The foundations have already been laid. It's up to us to engage. Unceded territories, that's what it looks like. There is no maritime Canada. But kudos to the Pesamogwadi, the Wolustuwik, the Mi'kmaq, for extending and for renewing this relation, this potential relationship, energy transitions. Because the bulk of climate change, if we've been all faithful to our relationship, would not exist had we been paying attention as acts of love and kindness to each other. Because the preponderance of these resources, quote unquote, are on Indian lands, unceded Indian lands. And the reason we talk about it, describe it as Indian lands, is because we have an obligation, the original obligations, the original treaties with the land to take care of it and to be mindful of how we are on a living land. Because we're not the only ones that drink water. 
We're not the only ones. I've seen snakes and butterflies and bees and ants. It's not a human right. It's a right to life. And we need to be conscious that we're not the only ones here. You know, when those early explorers were coming through our land and they seen these vast open territories, and they said, oh, that's not being used, terra nullius. But the reality is it was being used by our relatives. That's their homeland. And we depend on our relationship to them. They take care of us. It's amazing. When we have gatherings out in the open around the fire, eagle will come. Or moose will come. Because the moose has been guided to come where he hears the voices of human beings with the idea that maybe we need food and sustenance. And they're coming to offer themselves. That's the relationship we have. So maybe fundamentally, let's kind of take a little time and ask ourselves, where is it that we are right now? You know, and, and if it's a, a, an honest investigation, then we have something credible to work with. One part Indian country, one part North America. And, and as Ronnie had talked about, we don't see ourselves as part of Canada. There's no such creature as Canadian citizens, Canadian Aboriginal peoples. Because a fundamental tenet of international law is that citizens do not have treaties with their own government. They only exist between nations or at the level of the UN or NGOs. And I propose to you that's one of Canada's nightmares. How do you do the treaty? How do you get over the treaties? How do we deal with the legacies of genocide by, that are still being nurtured by the Indian Act and so forth? And not by the treaties. You take away the Indian Act and what's left are the treaties. The Indian Act was a disguise, was a way to get our minds away from our treaty relationships and, and uh, responsibilities to each other. So I'm suggesting let's take a little walk on the wild side. <laughs> let's re-examine those kinds of values that we hold on, because some of those values have, have been so entrenched and embedded that we can't even see our relationships, the isms and the ologies and the values and the dogmas. This is my favorite, evolution and not revolution. We don't have concepts for rights, but we do have concepts for responsibilities. We were all born with rights. It's natural. We don't have to spend all of our times. All we have to do is respect each other and live that way. And that, that respect and living that way is about that love. The earth loves us. The earth knows you in a way that earth knows us. We spend a lot of our time sitting with the earth, kind of thing. Arunda Hadid, I think that's how I pronounce it, Arunda Hadid? Yeah. I so adore this woman. She is a, a, a meticulous, heartfelt, joy to read her, her work, and she's inspired me over the years. And I'm concerned at this moment because the government of Canada is prosecuting her for her point of view. You know, and, and so I'm sending out messages of prayers and for her safety. Um, but she's a joy, and, and when I read this, I was so inspired. But I, I use this for one purpose, you know, it might be scary what I'm suggesting to you, but don't worry. Just do what you're doing and believe in what you're doing and elevate your own energy levels, energy transit to the higher qualities of our being. And if you do that, you're not going to be alone. There's roughly 600 million indigenous peoples in the world as I speak. 
600 million people who are determined to maintain who they are in their relationships to the earth and are not being persuaded to think otherwise. Because there's nothing that we see, you know, compels us to think otherwise, you know. And the Papa Pachamama Alliance and the 350.org, I've come across their work before. And they have determined that there are two million organizations in the world at this time who are devoted to economic, um, ecological, environmental, if you will, and social justice, who often link to indigenous values and indigenous peoples. Two million organizations in the world, and what kind of a population is that? So I suggest that there's at least a billion people out there who are thinking differently and who are living differently and who are acting differently. You know, the only challenge for us is CNN and CBC doesn't carry that. That's not the news. So I'm suggesting to you there's a lot more happening. The esoteric quality of creation, there's a lot more happening out there than we can even begin to imagine. And we just need to plug in, spend time with the earth. Because she's already talking to you, and sometimes she even grabs your, grabs your imagination. That's a real thing, you know. So, oh. In closing, I've been feeling this, I don't even know how long. But I've been feeling this thing on the horizon and it's coming at us. And it has, a, it has a tremendous force, and it's going to change. Some, some of that change is not going to be welcomed. As most of us are living in a fear-based reality, and we can't seem to think beyond, you know. And we're afraid of everything. We're, you know, it, it's, it's, it's unconscionable to me to think that people are afraid of us. But they are. And when we suggest we need to do something different, they're afraid of what that is. You know? And they're afraid of what that is because they don't experience what that is. That's not where they're at. You know, we're kind of in a survival mode. We don't have enough. What we do you know, is, is not enough. Maybe we need more. You know? But this thing that's coming at us, it's not stoppable. And I look at it, it's coming to, it's kind of like a calling. Maybe the earth has been calling this to, to find its rebalance because we're not doing enough as human beings. Or maybe it's humanity who's been calling this, you know, those of us who are doing things. Because if, we, if it wasn't for the fact that there's all these organizations doing out there that we don't know what they're doing, we don't know it, all we see is what we're being fed. And it's pretty gloomy and scary what we're being fed. And it sort of adds to you know, the melodramas that we create for ourselves. But that's not the reality. You know? There are things that are happening. And I feel it. So this thing is coming at us. It's coming to restore, revitalize. It's all about raising our human consciousness where we should have been long ago when we had all these avatars who lived among us. And for a while we were inspired, and then we sort of drift off, you know. The only difference is we needed to apply those teachings of love. It's about applying what we know, what we feel. And that's the trick. So I leave you with this. I find this kind of interesting that there are women here <laughs> portrayed. I guess men psychologists, we can't get away from them. <laughs> uh, but the reality is, is that we need to invest in each other in ways that support the energies that we carry, the energies that determine how we live in the world.